Hi, Stephen. Morning. Um, thanks for coming in. Uh, h- how did you feel when you found out last night? Uh, instantly kind of like I'd been punched in the gut. Um, I kind of My first thought was, not this week. Yeah. I mean, I kept thinking about – right away I was thinking about songs like The Future and Democracy is Coming to the USA. And I thought like, well, this is when we need Leonard the most. Um, his wry and uh, bitter sense of humor would be – the light for a lot of people who who needed it at this time, and uh, you know, I, I think he's left us with with a lot to to digest and look back on. But that was the first thought. I was doing a benefit concert at um, the Sony Center in Toronto last night, and as I walked out the door, I saw the poster for the, his um, concert there in 1993 oh, wow. on the Future Tour, and I was at that show, and it just it struck me that you know I wasn't going to see another one again. Yeah, I saw your your photo you put up of that, and you saw him in 1993. But what was do you remember the first your first um the the first time you met Leonard Cohen's music the first time you came across it sure i think i i must have known suzanne as a one of those standards that was around um but i remember as a young teen seeing the um the movie i am a hotel it was a video production that was done i think with with uh, city tv back in the early 80s video like early canadian yeah. video art it was dance and song and uh, had a so i think had songs like dance me to the end of love right. and uh, memories from death of a ladies man a bunch of a bunch of songs strung together with a loose plot and that was kind of what originally hooked me into or mystified me about cohen and then i remember buying the first his first record and just being completely enamored with it. You know? what, 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 what was it? What, 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 was, what do you think it was that hooked you, that, that made you so enamored with it? Well, combination between the, the lyrics that were dark. I think, you know, another thing, an early thing I heard was, was Nick Cave's version of Avalanche. Oh, yeah. So I had, I had approached initially Leonard Cohen the same way I think a lot of people had, especially before his, his renaissance in the late 80s and early 90s, that sense of him being kind of the... Um, uh, dour, glum, dark, suicidal poet, which, you know, suited my teenage life very well. Mm-hmm. But when I'd listen to it and I'd hear the, the, the uh, big echoey um, female backup vocals and, uh, you know, odd arrangement choices, really um, dense strings over on one side of the mix and then just guitar and bass on the other side. And um, I started to kind of find the humor and the personality. And then from then I, I, I dove into the the, the books of poetry and the, and his, his novels, and he was my guy. He was just my guy after that. And I remember when I'm Your Man came out in, I, I want to say, 88, mm-hmm. and uh, I think the kind of the, the general um, critical line was like, whoa, he's being funny now. He's, there's jokes here. But there were always jokes, and that's uh, it was just a point where people started to notice that, that there was a balance between um, – the darkness and the light that he's always been singing about that balance. Did you see Leonard Cohen's writing, like Leonard Cohen's influence in your writing? Oh, sure. I mean, even in, in just things like um, like rhythm and rhyme scheme, mm-hmm. you know, I learned how to how to organize thought in a song by listening to his music. The same way I think a lot of us do from listening to Dylan's music, and I, I learned a lot from that as well. But there are lots of times where I'll go. Oh yeah, that's um, uh, one of us cannot be wrong, or that is you know like I, I know I've just taken that that template of uh, true love leaves no traces and I've rewritten it with my own melody and, and and lyrics. They become kind of templates in a way for writing songs. Yeah, like he, he's so influential that that he gets in there without you even noticing. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, back in two thousand six, I want to because you know Leonard Cohen. Most of the stories we're getting are people who have met him. Like mm-hmm. he spent a little bit of time with them, got to got to hang out with him a little bit. Um, but you had this very memorable encounter with Leonard Cohen, and I remember seeing this like shortly after it got posted on YouTube because my mother always sang this song around the house, and I learned how to sing it from a very very young age. And my father, my brother sang it, my sister, and uh, I, I had never heard him sing it like in his older age. And then maybe like the weeks later, this got posted up on YouTube. Uh, just just take a listen to this. Then why do I feel so all alone? But if I'm standing, I'm standing here in your spider web. It's fascinating my
that's a that's a beautiful moment and that's Leonard Cohen, by the way. He would never say in that stage of his life that he could still sing that high. You never hear him sing that high octave. No, I guess I just thought he couldn't, but he, he did. Yeah, yeah, that was one of the greatest things I'd ever experienced was staying, you know, the whole experience of standing on stage with him singing. This where, was, where, where was this? This was at, um, it was on Bay Street in Toronto. They had, uh, the Indigo store there had, had done a uh, book launch for the Book of Longing when he put that out. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, they said, well, he's going to be there and he'll greet the crowd and they're going to block off the street, but he's not going to sing, but we're going to have some other musicians come. Would you come and sing a song or two? So Ron Sexsmith was there and I came and, uh, and some other people. And when I first showed up at the store, they took me downstairs to the store, you know, stock room downstairs and everybody was sitting around with Leonard singing Leonard Cohen songs and talking and whatever and having a good, good time and kind of running through the stuff. And mm-hmm. as we were about to walk on stage, I t- turned to Leonard and said, do you want to sing a song? I thought, well, maybe somebody just, maybe he changed his mind or maybe nobody asked him. And he said, no, but I'd be more than happy to share a microphone with you. Wow. And wow. there we went up there and did that. And we went, we did, I was doing So Long, Marianne, and uh, uh, we were doing Sisters of Mercy as well. And uh, uh, he was staring right at me as we sang. And I thought, like, I just, I felt like I was being blessed. Like he was, you know, saying, don't worry, everything's going to be okay with his infinite wisdom and those piercing green eyes. But what he was really <laughs> saying was, what's the next line? <laughs> well, that's the thing I was going to say, because in the, you, you, you hear these two voices, I'm assuming yours and Ron's. I, I think, yeah, he turns to, he turns to Ron and Ron gives him the next line. But... I, I, yeah, and then you're, he's, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. I'm standing on the edge and you're, spider, spider, spider. Yeah. fine spider, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, I think he, has, he probably hadn't sung it in you know in thirty years, but to watch his him, obviously he was not prepared to sing and and has been singing in that low register since you know since the mid eighties mm-hmm. and to hear him go way up like that like he used to you know I always crank the end of, of a song like Leaving Green Sleeves where he really screams it and I love that mm-hmm. and to be on stage while he was getting into it like that. Was a really amazing moment. I think there, you know, I think there are musicians, you know, maybe like Dylan or maybe like others, who, as they get older, you know, they don't reflect incredibly fondly on their older music, you know, and they don't yeah. want to sing the hits, and they don't, and they don't take any joy really from hearing the, you know, the original version of like a Rolling Stone or you know, or, or, or Stairway to Heaven or something like that. But you get the feeling in that moment that Leonard Cohen really. He really valued what he had done. He really valued that music, and he seemed to really genuinely love that people loved it. Well, and I think I think it goes back to the the quote you played earlier, where I think he really appreciated the fact that people got something else out of what he was what he had written. And I think when you look back on your older material, often what you hear are the mistakes right. or the, the 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 things you wouldn't choose to do now, and you always feel like the things you would choose to do now are better than what you would choose then, mm-hmm. and. Uh, when you hear somebody else get something out of it, um, if you can put yourself in that head headspace, I know other songwriters who cannot stand people covering their material. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, you know, Leonard was not only diplomatic, but I think really understood what the what the value to him was of that of somebody else singing his song. Yeah, he he seemed to take a real joy from 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 his own music, which is which is such a rare thing in artists. Yeah, and he also he he really took great joy in other musicians and other singers. I mean, that's why, you know, he was always very supportive of, you know, had top-notch bands on, on yeah. tour with him or singers like Jennifer Warrens and so on who really could could take his music to places that he felt he couldn't. And really gave that moment. Uh, I mean, there was always those moments in the live shows where he would he would stand back and take off his hat and salute the guitarist or the, or the violinist. He, that's right. He, he was very gracious with his band as well. Yeah. Um, this is a question I've been asking a lot on the program today, but, you know, seeing as today's kind of the day we're all kind of dealing with this, uh, when you look back at, at Leonard Cohen, you know, what, what's the image that's, that's etched in your mind? Hmm. Um, photographically, I would say the images of, I always think about the, the cover of Live Songs, which was, I think, about 1970-ish, and it's, it's him with his head shaved, smoking a cigar, and he says it's, he said it was um, taken right after he escaped from the monastery. Mm-hmm. And you know, this is a guy who was always, I mean, it's a great metaphor, I think, for who he was. He was in and out all the time. He was all in, and, and he would be a Buddhist monk. And then he would, not only would he leave, he'd escape. He'd <laughs> run away from it and, and write and drink and carouse and tour and then go back in. And that's, that, that dichotomy 
is all over his his writing and his performances and his personality. The sense that people always treated him, and he played into it, they, they treated him as, as this wise sage. But he would also, in in the next line, tell you he had none of the answers, right after telling you he had them all. <laughs> Stephen Page, I, I can't thank you enough for dropping by today, talking a little bit about Leonard Cohen and what he means to you. My pleasure. <laughs> 